What's up? How's it going, my friends? I'm so happy to be back uh, today. I want to get right into it because I have a lot of uh, exciting kind of things to go over. I want to thank the folks that contacted me over the week. I was able to uh, help out a few of you, answer some questions about legal issues you had. And uh, today I want to get right into it because it's going to be a great episode. We're going to talk about some uh, little bit of world history, some art history, uh, some different treaties that the United States have signed and kind of like some civil procedure issues. And you're going to learn about all these things while we talk about this awesome and interesting lawsuit over a painting. Let's see. Uh, this is a painting by uh, Cami Pesaro. All right. He was a Dutch impressionist and it's a beautiful painting here. It's uh, I'll just say in the English version, Rue Saint André uh, in the afternoon with the effect of rain. All right. That's the English translation. Any of my French speakers out there here? I got an idea. Uh, if I can get one of my French speakers, I'll dub it in right now. Rue Saint André dans l'après-midi. All right, that is the French way of saying uh, the name of this painting. Okay, so the reason why this painting is such a big deal, and you're going to learn so much about different topics and especially of uh, legal issues. Like I say, I like to teach the law through these interesting stories and interesting cases uh, that have gone around. So this particular painter, all right, uh, Camille Pissarro, the, our impressionist, and um, well, first... The deal with the Impressionists and why they were such a big deal is, you know, like back in the day with European art, like Michelangelo, the, you know, creation of, of Adam and all of that. Like if you see these paintings, they're these like beautiful, like divine, like out of this world, you know, kind of paintings. And these people look so like majestic and, you know, and then you got God, right? Like a picture of God in here in, in uh, Michelangelo's painting. So the Impressionists, they kind of uh, uh, started a revolution, so to speak, in the sense that instead of painting these amazing things, they wanted to paint kind of like everyday uh, objects and kind of like the streets that they lived in and the parks they went to or the trains that they sat in and things like that. So they kind of wanted to make uh, paintings of everyday life and instead of like these majestic divine uh, type of things and kind of uh, you could learn so much about their lifestyle and what is going on in the world and the philosophy and everything through paintings of just simple everyday occurrences. OK, so uh, that movement was obviously a very big deal. This particular painter, the subject of uh, this, this ginormous lawsuit uh, over this about 20 years old, the, the lawsuit itself. So he was born in 1830. Now, he was born in what is now the U.S. Virgin Islands, but he's not American because back then in 1830, the, that part of the world, the U.S. Virgin Islands, was part of the, uh, the Dutch. Right? It was part of the West Dutch Indies. OK, and so uh, so he grew up in uh, Dutch, right? Not in Holland, but in the Dutch lands of, uh, what is now the U S Virgin islands. Okay. And then in 1842, when he was 12 years old, his, uh, his family sent him to Paris to go to boarding schools. And that's where it all starts, right? Cause then in Paris in the 1840s, uh, and 1850s, he starts mingling and, and, and studying, you know, painting and art and, and all this stuff. Um, Gosh, when I was at UCLA, by the way, in the 1990s, I remember I had a friend that he was studying from France and uh, he always talked about like why we work in the summer. Like his, <laughs> in France, they have like all this time off in the summer. And uh, I just remember how he was talking. Uh, he goes, why don't you come visit me in uh, July? And I said, why? Uh, aren't you going to be working? He says, no, it is the summer and we do not work in the summer. <laughs> right. <laughs> we need that in America. We need July off. All of July off. What do you think? That would be rad. OK. So anyway, uh, so so our uh, impressionist is uh, working and and living in Paris and, and all that jazz. And the funny part about all this 
is where before we get into what uh, you know that the, the painting was stolen by the Nazis in World War II. It's actually not World War II that's the main subject of how all of this came about. It was actually in 1870, it was the French-Prussian War, uh, which I guess <laughs> you could almost call it like, uh, what is it, a prequel to World War II when the French and Germans fought in 1870, Germany back then, the, the Prussian part, okay? Uh, so the French-Prussian War, and because our friend here, Mr. Pesaro, is... Dutch, he couldn't serve in the French army and he was worried about some sort of persecution. So he left France and moved to England uh, in the, in eight, in, uh, during that time, 1870, 1871. And it was there that he started meeting these uh, art dealers. Uh, so he was able to start selling and living off his paintings and whatnot. And it was also there uh, that he met Monet, another big impressionist. You'll, you might know from the painting the water lilies, okay, that very popular Monet painting. All right, um, and now we get into then when he painted the subject of this matter. So in 1897 uh, is when this painting, when Mr. Pissarro uh, painted this beautiful, this beautiful masterpiece. He paints it in 1897, and the painting itself is called Rue Saint-Honoré dans le premier midi And uh, I'll, I'll just translate the rest of it into English in the afternoon with the effect of rain. And then, by the way, the, the Saint Henri was a, a saint in the uh, sixth century in France. And when he died, there was like this big funeral procession where everyone, they started baking cakes for that funeral procession or something. And to this day, that is kind of the saint of baked cakes. Uh, and there's a feast on May 16, apparently, I learned that part of kind of like honoring this saying with this guy, like it's like a cake day uh, or something. So anyway, so so this particular painting, and for those of you that aren't, uh, you know, that are just listening to this, I have the painting up. It's this beautiful painting of a an actual street in Paris that looks just like this. And as you can see here, it's, uh, you know, like in the afternoon after the, the rain had finished, and you have here different people, different walks of life, you know, rich, poor. They're like mingling, you know, near each other. They're going on their way. Some of them are in a carriage. Some of them are not. Some are poor. Some are rich. Uh, different ethnicities. And just kind of the painting just shows what life is like in Paris and what the society is like and how they kind of live. And this is much different than previous European works of the, the Renaissance where everything was so you know, majestic and divine and all that jazz, right? So this painting was done in 1897. In uh, 1900, uh, the year 1900, then Mr. Pissarro, the painter, his art dealer sold it to a prominent German Jewish family. And I say the, the you know, the German Jewish family part because we're going to fast forward soon to World War II and uh, we know what happened there, right? So, uh, so in 1900 then, this was purchased by a uh, the, the Jewish family, the kind of uh, the Kassiri family. They're the plaintiffs now in, in the particular case. Uh, they purchased it in the year 1900. And it's important because the actual painter died in the year 1903. So he died just a couple of years after this painting was purchased. Um, and it was such a big deal uh, that even another big Impressionist painter, Cezant, all right, you may know, under uh, some of his popular paintings, like this one here, it's a it's a popular painting, and there's two guys playing poker. But it was such a big deal because it kind of, uh, it, like I said, it breaks with the previous norm of of uh, this majestic and divine paintings, and it just shows two guys playing poker and uh, and how their lives are. And if you could look, you know, one is a little, uh, you know, dressed a lot differently than the other. They're playing poker. They're not even looking at each other. They're in a French. Uh, saloon uh, and and whatnot, and Cezanne said of the the painter in question here that he was the very first true impressionist. Okay, uh, that is obviously a very big deal. And Cezanne studied under this guy, uh, you know, the the painter of the the French Street. Okay, now uh, that prominent Jewish family, the Kassiri family owned this painting and it was uh, in their art gallery in Berlin. And at one point, you know, they, there's this famous, uh, just uh, it's famous in the legal world. There's a, a picture here. This is a, a picture of the Kassiri family home in Berlin. 
And if you could see it right there, you could see the painting in their family home. This is in their uh, in their house in Berlin in the 1930s. OK, and the, that painting was there. Um, and then in 1933, you know, as we know from from our history lesson, so the Nazis started taking over in Germany and the it was very clear about, you know, kind of the um, the attitude toward the Jews and whatnot. And in 1939, it was Lily Kassiri. She inherited the painting from her uncle, Paul Kassiri. He's the one that purchased it in 1900. He had uh, passed away in the interim. And then so she inherited it. And in 1939, she decided she has to leave Germany, uh, you know, because of this, uh, you know, what was the, the attitude toward the Jews and, and what was obviously starting to happen. So when she left in 1939 to obtain a visa to go to England, she had to sell the painting and she sold it for a few bucks. It was something like 900 Deutschmarks or something like that. It, and she had to, to use it so that she could get a visa uh, to go to England. And, and like they wouldn't issue it to her, but then she gave this painting or she sold it for that cheap price to some Nazi officer. And uh, in exchange, they gave her a visa to go to England. So that's how she then fled Germany in 1939 without this painting. And uh, a little bit of history that I learned as I you know, was researching this for, for this podcast, there was... This poor lady, she didn't even get to London right away. It took her a few years. And in those few years, she ended up in this in internment camp in Morocco. Uh, and it was like very interesting in the sense that she ends up in Morocco because, um, as you know, the French surrendered to the Germans and Morocco was under French rule. And there was this concern about, OK, the Germans, who are like the secret Nazis in here and who are the true refugees and so, uh, so it was this mix, this internment camp. It was run by Mor the Moroccan government, the French government, but the French government, um, you know, uh, lost to the Germans. So they weren't, you know, they were occupied and it was run by the German government. So she was in this like uh, limbo for a few years, but thankfully she was able to in 1942 get out and go to London. All right, then with the painting, um, and the reason why this is important is, is because in the lawsuit, this history of everything kind of relates to, well, who's the freaking true owner of this painting? And that question is like a $400 million question or a $300 million question, because that's the value of the painting today, okay? Uh, so she then uh, goes to London, and her family, obviously, this is, you know, after World War II, they lost all you know, connection, and they, they definitely didn't know where their art was, and especially this particular piece, okay? And then, in, and it turned out in 1952, uh, it was sold to somebody in New York, um, and then it was held privately, meaning in a private collection, all the way from 1952 to, like, 1976. It was held privately, meaning it was in some dude's house, okay? Um, and so, and then, you know, they obviously didn't know whose house, and it was kind of in this underground world, so to speak, of the art world, they didn't they didn't have a, a an idea of where it was, and uh, it was so bad that there were some laws in uh, the German Federal Republic uh, after World War II. The German Federal Republic, more commonly known as West Germany, they tried to have some laws that kind of compensated some families for property that was stolen from the Nazis. And in 1958, they gave. Uh, Lily Kassiri some money to compensate her for this loss of this painting. It, it, it was something like in today, Deutschmarks in today's value would be like 200 grand or 250 grand. It was something in that range uh, that, that the West Germany gave her in 1958. So she was able to get some money. Uh, and then that poor girl uh, died in 1962. Ah, now we go fast forward. We're finally getting to present time. Um, and then and then to the lawsuit where you're going to learn how kind of the law is going to handle all of this in this 20 plus year lawsuit over this. In 1976, then a very rich baron of Germany, Baron Hans Heinrich Thesel Bormisia. OK, I know I pronounced that wrong. Uh, so he purchases the painting in 1976 and he keeps it in his house, uh, in Switzerland until the, about the 1990s. Uh, and it was a funny story because this guy, he is the descendants of very, very rich Germans from the 1800s who sold 
uh, weapons and steel manufacturers, and then they had so much money. A lot of times, these these very very rich folks, when they have so much money, they start um, buying and selling expensive art too. Uh, so he bought this art, uh, you know, secretly in 1976, uh, and and he kept it in his private house all the way up until the 90s. Then, uh, before he died, he married when he was like 70 or 60. I think 65 years old. He married a, it was his fifth marriage. You know, fifth is a lucky number uh, for some people. So in his fifth marriage, he married Miss Spain. Uh, and she was about 23 years younger than him. Uh, and so he marries the, the, the former Miss Spain and kind of uh, moves to Spain, lives in Spain. Um, and the reason why that's important is because then in 1990, he sells his whole or a bunch of his art, like a, a big portion of his art collection. He sells it to the Spanish government for $300 million in the early 90s. Um, and sure enough, finally, this painting kind of uh, resurfaces finally because the Spanish government then, uh, you know, they had in one of their museums in Madrid, they, uh, what's it called? They put this painting up. All right. And so finally, then in 1999, to advertise the new museum, the new the museum's new collection, this painting was in the advertisement and it and one of the family members, friends saw it and he contacted Claude uh, Kassiri. So Claude Kassiri, just to follow the secession, he is the grandson of Lily uh, Kassiri, okay? Just to kind of follow. She was the original person that had the uh, the the painting, okay? She she was the one that had it from her uncle, uh, and she was the one that left uh, Germany. So he, he gets wind of it, and he then hires lawyers, and finally we have our lawsuit. It was in the year 2005. The Kassiri family files a lawsuit against the Spanish government uh, saying that they're the rightful owners of this painting and gosh darn it, they want it back, <laughs> all right? Um, and I, I went through all that history just so you understand the kind of the reason behind the value of the painting and kind of how it was uh, in, the, uh, in the black market, so to speak. I don't really like using that term black market, but you know, like the uh, illegal market for several decades. And finally it resurfaces in 1999. And, uh, and then it took a few years for the lawsuit to start because they tried, the family tried with the Spanish government to work out an, a friendly deal to get the painting back. That obviously didn't work. So then a lawsuit was filed in 2009 and 2005. Now, one funny thing about all of this is I was teaching law in the year 2005 and I would, I talked about this case right when it was filed and I said something like, and I remember saying, this case is going to take a while. And, uh, you know, because students would always ask me, oh man, I want to follow up on this and let me know how it ends and blah, blah, blah. I go, we, we, put, we may not know the answer for five more years. And I said that in 2005, right? It's now 2022, and we're, we're not even close to getting a final answer here. Uh, can you imagine me telling the students, yeah, check back up with me in 17 years uh, in 2022, so then I could tell you to check back with me in another 10 years. Like, wow, all right? I'm going to go through why the heck this is taking so long to get a simple answer. Who owns this freaking piece of art, Okay. Uh, so I apologize to those students who I told in 2005, check back with me in five years, give it some more, give it another decade from now, and then uh, hook me up. Okay, so now comes the lawsuit in 2005, right? The family, uh, Claude uh, Kassiri, he files the lawsuit in a federal court in California. And uh, what the heck, how is California going to uh, get involved? Remember, what's the first order of business in every lawsuit? Jurisdiction, okay? The first order of business is jurisdiction. And, uh, and it is such an important thing that to this day, 17 years later, we're still disputing jurisdiction, <laughs> okay? Uh, so he files this lawsuit in 2005. Um, and the reason why it's in a federal court as opposed to a state court in California. Let's just start with that. There's what's called diversity jurisdiction here, meaning 
The plaintiff is a California resident, Mr. Kassiri, and the defendant is Spain, okay, which is not a California resident. It's a country in Europe, right? Um, and, uh, wow, they just lost to Morocco in the World Cup, man, speaking of, a little, little, little angle there. Okay, so uh, so he sues the country of Spain, right? Um, and uh, the reason why it's in federal court is because if you have a resident of one state that's a plaintiff, and then the defendant is a resident of a different state or different country, then you have diversity of jurisdiction. And as long as the dispute is over $75,000, here it's worth, you know, hundreds of millions, then you could sue in a federal court. The federal court then has subject matter jurisdiction. Um, so that's why he's allowed to sue in federal court. The, the next order of business is he has to have what's called personal jurisdiction over the country of Spain in California. Uh, this is where I said there's all of this there's uh, we had we talked about some of the uh, history of the the art history, some history of all these like, you know, a few different wars and and, you know, the internment camp in Morocco and all that jazz. Now there's also a a little bit of history in terms of uh, international treaties. There's been a lot of international treaties or the, over the past few centuries over da, 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 jurisdiction. <laughs> okay. My favorite topic, right? So uh, these treaties, one of them, one of them, the many, many, or I should say many, many treaties uh, over jurisdiction go over when a country agrees with another country that it could be sued in the other country. <laughs> All right. And uh, what that means is in certain cases, like the United States agreed with Spain and, you know, France and Canada that for certain purposes, it could be sued in those other countries. And a treaty is that those other countries agreed with the United States that those countries could be sued for certain purposes in the United States, okay? Because without that treaty, you, you can't just sue another country. The United States court would say, we don't have a treaty with them. You know, there's no, uh, you don't have personal jurisdiction over that country in this court. So you have to find some sort of uh, a treaty that allowed it. And then usually you don't cite the treaty. What happens is then when there's a treaty, then there will be a federal law that's written that says you can sue these particular countries. I I, I used to do some family law. And, and for example, there's also treaties like if you, you know, uh, if a dad like kidnaps the kids or something, you know, and takes them to, uh, let's say, Canada. So there's a treaty with Canada that, you know, there's that a, a decision here in the United States will have effect in Canada and, and vice versa. Um, however, there's not a treaty like that with, for example, Lebanon or Brazil. The reason why I know this is then uh, like sometimes if there's a divorce in California with, you know, Brazilians or, or Lebanese or or Cubans or something, uh, there's a concern that, whoa, if the dad or mom takes the kids to their home country uh, we don't have jurisdiction to get a judgment here that will have effect over there, okay? Uh, and that's because, you know, those treaties weren't signed with those countries. Do you see what I'm saying? So in 2005, the reason why the Kassiri family was able to sue Spain is because there was that treaty that said over stolen artwork you can file a lawsuit against that other country, okay? Okay. Um, and so that's where that's where the personal jurisdiction comes in, uh, is because of that law and that kind of treaty. So that's why he's allowed to sue them in California. And he has to go to federal court as opposed to state court because of that diversity of jurisdiction. OK, so there we have it. Wow. All right. So in 2005, now you would think that, OK, cool. Um, the law is is clear in the sense that if a government gets a hold of of some sort of stolen art, that, well, it's not clear, but some in some uh, situations, they have to give the art back. Somehow, though, I don't know how this works, but apparently it doesn't apply to the British <laughs> because the British have, if you go to the British Museum, they have art from everywhere, right? And that they did not give back, okay? Uh, those were different treaties that they signed, and basically those treaties were, okay, we'll give a little bit of it back and stop bugging us about the rest, okay? So here we go about this particular uh, piece. In 2005, he files a lawsuit, then... A portion of jurisdiction, um, it's it's kind of a, a, a subject that's that's below jurisdiction or part of jurisdiction and, and a little to the side of jurisdiction. It's called choice of law, all right? What this means is this. The lawsuit is happening in California 
Uh, and then the next question is, do we apply California's laws or do we apply the laws of Spain? All right. That is the next order of business is, is what law we're going to start applying. And that's called choice of law. It's kind of a, 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 you know, like I said, it's a subject within this jurisdiction. All right. And believe it or not, this is going to drive you crazy because for the last 17 years, we're debating this or the courts have been debating this. And it, it went from the trial court in California to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals all the way to the United States Supreme Court, this, this issue. And it kind of goes like this. The California court, uh, the federal court in California said, OK, uh, we're going to apply the, you know, like the federal rules to decide what we're going to apply, uh, California law or Spanish law. The reason why that's different, in Spain, there is a rule that if a, they call it a bona fide purchaser, if a bona fide purchaser buys something that they did not know was stolen, um, and, and if they uh, had that artwork uh, for a long enough amount of time, it becomes theirs, okay? Uh, that's a Spanish rule. In California, it's not necessarily the case. So even if you're a bona fide purchaser, a bona fide purchaser means that they bought the painting in good faith, not knowing it was stolen. How the country of Spain didn't know it was stolen, I don't know. But that's what they kind of, you know, that's their argument. But the bottom line is then the, in California, the, the rule with artwork is even if it's a good faith purchaser who purchased something thinking it was not stolen or looted from the past, uh, that person still has to give it up, uh, that, that artwork. So it's going to make it or break it kind of what are we going to apply California law or are we going to apply the Spanish law, right? And the federal court in California decided in, in what law we apply, get this, uh, for, for you future lawyers, young lawyers, aspiring lawyers, uh, this, is, this is the stuff that, uh, you know, the, law, that, the lawsuits take years and years over. And for those who are not lawyers, this is why you should be thankful you're not a lawyer. No, just kidding. No, this is why it's so hard to explain to, to the good people out there, like, why does this lawsuit take 15 years? Okay, so here we go. Uh, the California court then had to decide, are you ready? What law do we use to decide what law we use to decide this case? All right. I'm not joking. I am not, not joking. Okay. Uh, or I'm not, not, not joking. Right. So the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal then ruled that we're going to use these various federal laws uh, to decide which law we're going to use. And when they did that, they decided the Spanish law should rule, okay? Um, and then they said because of this bona fide purchaser deal and whatnot, then the country of Spain can keep the painting, all right? That was the final decision in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal. Um, maybe I should not have said the word final, <laughs> all right? Because then da, 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 the family appealed the ruling to the United States Supreme Court. And believe it or not, the United States Supreme Court, right? Our taxpayer dollars at work. No, no. This, uh, the United States Supreme Court took on this case uh, and, and uh, just, you know, the, the, all nine judges agreed, okay? And Justice Kagan writing the opinion for the court uh, stated that, well, it's an important topic. It's an important topic that all of the United States Supreme Court needs to decide which law decides which law will decide the case. In this Supreme Court case, they said, well, the, the matter is that um, in a different podcast, I once said there's all these different like circuit court of appeals. And it's only the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal that states we're going to use federal law to decide which set of rules we're going to use to decide which choice of law we're going to use, okay? The, all of the other circuits don't do that. They, what they say is we're going to use that state's rules to decide which uh, choice of law we're going to use to decide the case. And, and then the United States Supreme Court uh, ultimately ruled that the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal errored and that it, it should have used the California laws 
in relation to what law should govern the dispute, <laughs> okay? Um, and then, this is my favorite part, okay? The, the, the court then said that, da, 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 after it said that, it said, we're not going to decide how uh, the California court should rule. We're just going to decide that the California court should use California law to decide if California law will govern this case or Spanish law will govern this case. Um, and, the, and the way that works, it's kind of, it's this theory. The judges say, uh, you know, if, if I was to ask the judge, well, judge, well, can you just decide if we can use Spanish law or California law, the judge would say, no, of course not. That is not before the court because the United States Supreme Court only has jurisdiction to decide things that are on appeal. OK, and so here the judge would say, uh, we're not going to decide that. We're going to let the lawyers fight a few more years in the California court so that then the California court could decide uh, if they're going to use California law to decide if we're going to use California law or Spanish law, all right? I'm not joking about those different levels, all right? So after all this, uh, the court then uh, sent the case back in April of 2022. It sent the case back to the California Court of Appeals, all right? Then, and that's where the case sits now. It sits in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. And hopefully in the next year, this is the decision we're going to get from the Ninth Circuit Co Court of Appeal. All right, hopefully in the next year or two, uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal will then decide which law, um, or, or I'm sorry, yeah, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal using California law will then decide if we're going to use California law or Spanish law, right? My um, gut feeling would be that the ruling that they're going to use is probably going to then decide that California law should apply, okay? Um, the Supreme Court already ruled that the California law should apply to how we're going to choose which law applies to choose the case, to, to, to <laughs> adjudicate the case. Um, it, they already made that ruling. And my gut feeling would be that then the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal will say, well, according to California law, because the, you know, the plaintiffs live here, and that there's, um, you know, there's a big decision to be made here, then we should, you, you know, the California law should apply. A lot of lawyers will disagree with me. They would say something like, but the painting is in Spain, it's owned by the Spanish and blah, blah, blah. Spanish law should apply. I don't think so. I think my gut feeling is that the, Cali that the federal court will rule that the California law should apply in this case. Then we're still not done with the case, all right? At that point, then the case will go to a trial, a new trial. Uh, and then that trial, which will probably be in a few years from now, that trial will then decide uh, what's the fair outcome, okay? Um, and, and that being the case, it'll decide things like, was Spain a bona fide purchaser? It'll decide that did the Kassiri family, when they got the $250,000 in 1958, did that basically buy out their interest, you know? Uh, you know, then the California court will decide that particular uh, position. That will be in several years from now, okay? Um, and then even then, the case may be over, but then it could be appealed, okay, <laughs> uh, for other circumstances. All right, da -da 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 -da. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, my friends. I'll see you next week. Please keep the comments coming and keep me posted on interesting cases that you find, and I'd love to talk to you about it.